this um, this next session is aimed, you know, lots at registrars now and, um, you know, I suppose people becoming new consultants. Can I just um, can I just ask those of you that are here, just with a show of hands, how many of you are haematology registrars at the moment? Okay, so that that's that's most of the most of you, isn't it? Okay, and and, and uh, of you all, how, how many of you have already done a PhD? Okay, so few there. <laughs> and uh, how many of those registrars are thinking about doing one in the future? <laughs> okay, so, so so perhaps there are two of you then for this uh, <laughs> this talk. <laughs> okay. I, I, so so um, what we really want to just sort of talk about a bit is sort of some of the opportunities that there are for research and for getting funding for research. Now, it might be that some of you actually want to do this formally. Some of you want to do something like a PhD. But I think for everyone now, they have to, you know, think about involvement in research in some way or another. So just give you a little bit of background around this. I think firstly, I'm afraid this is a rather stretched picture of me at the top. Uh, this is just what I've done. And I think it's a relatively standard route for, for most people. Got a little taster of research while I was in medical school. And then another little taster of research when I started off doing my general medicine, my internal medicine. I think once you start haematology training, I think it's actually really difficult to try and work out when you're going to do research if you're going to do it. So I think one, a problem we all have in haematology is these exams. The FRC PATH exam is just pretty hellish, really, isn't it? and trying to squeeze it in somewhere around the research that you want to do. So I felt really needed at least three years to try and get that sort of thing out the way before I could go on and do some research. I, I was very fortunate to have this opportunity to do an academic clinical fellowship, which meant that you get a chance to do some research. So I had about nine months of research in my first three years as a registrar. So it's a real opportunity to try and build up some work. And I think it can be quite hard to start off as a, a you know, trying to do a, a, a PhD if you haven't had any chance to do any research at all. So it's really worth trying to get some time for that. And the reason I you know, picked my group and moved on to a particular group is that um, I, when I met my, who, the man who went on to be my uh, clinical supervisor, uh, Simon Stanworth, he was just so enthusiastic and full of ideas. It was absolutely brilliant being able to just sit down, come up with new ways you might deal with things, pull them apart, realize they didn't work at all, and then start again. And so, uh, you know, that, that experience was just brilliant. I thoroughly recommend taking some time out to just have that chance to think that you don't get all the time in the clinical world. I think it's brilliant. I've now come out the other side of that PhD. Um, I won't talk too much about the PhD itself, and, and both Paul and I want to, uh, you know, moving on now, trying to get those future posts. And we'll tell you a bit more about that later. I'll, I'll pass on to Paul now. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. So um, similarly to Mike, I've, I've been through a PhD as well in hemostasis, and I took a slightly different pathway into a PhD at first. So also doing a BSc at medical school, and when I was doing that BSc, I for some reason thought I wanted to be a neurologist at that point, and spent a year doing a basic science um, BSc in a neurobiology lab. So as you can see in the picture just underneath me, so growing swan cells, and I hated it. And... When I left medical school, I, I thought I'm never going to want to go into research ever, ever again. So when, after doing various medical jobs in my rotation, I did a purely clinical training up until that point, I, I found haematology. And I think it's finding something you're really interested in is really important when you're thinking about doing research. And then spent the first couple of years um, of the rotation and then went on to do, um, first of all, st registered as uh, doing an MD at the Royal London. Um, and during that time, sort of transitioned from doing an MD towards doing a PhD and had this quite crazy year in 2015, 2016 of writing up, submitting my thesis, applying for an ACL job and defending my thesis in the space of three months. So um, it's been quite an interesting time and it's, um, there's probably no right or wrong way of, of doing and going into things. But I just thought before we sort of look at things about funding it, in terms of thinking about if you are interested in doing research or getting more experience, just think some of the things that might be important to think about when looking at these things. And I think there's various different facts. So to, sort of just to summarize these into sort of the four Ps for today. So this is in terms of preparation, person, project and place. And this is something 
when you're applying for grants, they often look at these factors. So it's maybe not so much preparation, but that's always going to be there. But are you the right person? Is it the right project? And is it the, is it the right place to do your research? So the, top, the picture on the top is where I'm based at the Royal London, and I'm informed that the picture at the bottom is not quite what it looks like in Oxford, where you are. <laughs> so first of all, I think one thing I would say is if you're thinking about doing research, there's, it's never too early to start thinking. Um, as Mike said, the pressures of um, training with doing the FRC PATH exams are, are always there. And with, in terms of going out a program, if you don't go out early enough, then you, you may have to wait till after you finish your, finish your training to then look at doing research. And I think if you're looking at doing things, you need to think about what you want to do in the long term. I mean, it's great doing an MD or a P PhD, but what your end goal is is quite important. So I think if you're thinking, do you, if you want to be a, a, a clinician with a basic science lab, with a big team, then you're going to need to think about doing a project that gives you that experience and exposure to an early time. If you just want to be a hemostasis doctor with lots and lots of trials involved, that project will very much guide where you go with time. And with going into it, there's lots and lots of opportunities <coughs> that appear in training, so it's worthwhile taking advantage of those papers or cases that might come up during um, your placements. And the audits and quality improvement projects that we all have to do as part of our training Rather than just presenting it um, within the department, try to get it presented at a meeting. So r send abstracts into BSH and other meetings, and then th that's an extra thing on, on your CV. So within the other things, so when looking at a project and you're sort of thinking down, going down that line, you need to do something that you're interested in. If, you, if it's not interesting, it's just not going to be a non-starter if you are so two years into a PhD and you're thinking about sort of where you go from that point. And then hopefully, either you or your supervisor will have identified a, a research question and it's working out if that question's novel and then how you're going to carry this out and this is something that um, in the next presentation we're going to look at in terms of designing studies so you can answer the question that you initially set out to answer. So it's great getting lots and lots of data but if it actually doesn't answer the question you look to answer or doesn't be able to provide anything useful it, it's a long time of working for what might not be so useful. But then in many ways it's about money. Um, would, if you're looking to do research, there's going to have to be some funding that's going to drive that. And there's various different sources. So I think Mike's going to go into this in a few slides. But Mike was funded down the NIHR pathway, and, and I've been purely funded through pharmaceutical funding from my PhD. And there's advantages and disadvantages of both routes. Um, and then lastly, I think one thing I would say is ask around, talk to lots of different people. Just because you've got a haemophilia centre or a thrombosis centre within your own institution, there's many other places to speak to different people in different places, different countries. And it might be that you find a project that really suits you somewhere else and look at, look at the different advantages, that, as Mike was saying about when you met Simon, finding a supervisor that you can work well with and, and get on well with and who's, who's had many successful students coming through the institution is a good thing to look for. And within the project itself, um, what are you going to be doing? Are you going to be doing clinical work? Are you not going to be doing clinical work? Do you want to do on call? Do you not want to do on call? And there's no right answer to say for every, every different person, but everyone's needs throughout that time will be different. So before we look at any of the different um, f sort of funding side of things, I just wanted to ask a question. This is the first time we're using the polls, so I want to see if this works. <laughs> so what's the difference between an MD and a PhD? So, so I've put up a few different, um, and if you log on to the Slido and then go into that, that should come up as the first one on the poll. So first of all, is a PhD harder than an MD? Do you spend more time in the laboratory during a PhD? Is a PhD better than an MD? And are you more likely to get your results published by doing a PhD than an MD? Or maybe all of the above or none of the above? So I think the, oh, it's some changes, but in terms of the top two entrants are, are so far none of the above and a PhD is a higher degree than an MD. Just before I go through some of the details of, of actually what the differences are or not, um, so a PhD is harder than an MD. I, d I don't think we had any votes for that, which is true. I mean, any higher degree can be as hard as, hard as another degree and a master's could be just as, as hard as an MD and it all depends on the project you, you're doing. A PhD, more time in the laboratory, so we had 4% on that. Um, a PhD is often thought of being a, as a laboratory-based um, research degree, but it doesn't necessarily mean so. And you could spend just as much time in an MD in the lab as you would do in a PhD. 
The next one's interesting. So the second in the poll is a PhD, is a higher degree than an MD. Um, and you'd think that, wouldn't you? Um, but if you look at the University of London's regulations, a MD res is actually rated as being a higher degree than a PhD, which is a curious thing, which actually makes no sense. But, and I think in terms of it being higher, they were essentially looked at as being relatively equal degrees in terms of the research experience the two degrees get. And a PhD is more likely to be published. Well, it may be, it may not be. Some people have had PhDs where absolutely nothing's been published. Some people have had MDs where every single chapter's been published, and it really varies depending on how science decides to, to go one day or another. So in terms of looking at the actual differences or, or not, if you look at the... I spent a few evenings going through the regulations at the University of London, actually looking what the differences are within the regulations, which is a very long and very boring document. Um, so in terms of the actual time frames, the, the differences are... There are subtle differences. So the amount of time you need to be registered to do an MD is different to doing a PhD. So you only need to be registered for a period of two years rather than three, three years. The time when you submit your thesis, however, is very similar. So although you can only transfer onto a writing up status for a PhD after three years, you can technically submit it after two years, and the same for an MD as well. The process of registration is very similar, and at each stage you'll have different um, milestones that you have to progress through to get to the next stages. In terms of the actual only difference I could really find is the word limit. So within the University of London, a PhD's word limit is 100,000 words. Within an MD, it's 50,000 words. Although talking to Mike before um, the meeting, actually, it's 50,000 words in Oxford for doing a PhD. So that's only a subtle difference. And I think one thing to mention is probably the more, more the difference is the perception of the um, research degree. So when you're sitting in your viva at the end of doing your, your research, there's a perception that a MD... MD is more clinically orientated rather than a PhD, but there's no actual written rule that it has to be that way. And I guess the strange quirk of the UK is that um, no other country really has MDs apart from in their main medical degree. So if you're thinking about travelling abroad to work in a few years' time, you may need to, on your CV, make a special um, highlight of what you've done during that time. So then looking at the thesis, um, the thesis itself is the thesis regulations are the same for both sides um, and the important thing about any thesis is it, it's a story and it may not be the most coherent of stories but it's working out a thread that goes through the whole story so this, my analogy here is in Alice in Wonderland I don't know if any of you read it recently but um, <laughs> you have lots of different stories and poems that fo form together in terms of a greater theme and it, if you took one on its own it can work but then there's a greater thing it works as a longer thing the actual thesis, it needs to be original, it needs to be your own work, um, it needs to give a good account of what you've done and show that you're, you've got the understanding and have that critical appraisal of what you've been doing and what p other people have been, have been doing in the past and during the time have developed as an academic and as a clinician and hopefully it will have contributed something to the research field and maybe it will be publishable. So before we move on to the next part, um, when you register for your PhD or MD, you'll be asked on the many, many forms that you fill in to give a title. And that title will follow you through. So <laughs> think what you write down on that box before, when, rather than just filling it in quickly, because I, I didn't do a poll for this one, I'm not sure if you know. <laughs> but this is the poll sort of for naming of this boat, which ended up for a short time being called Boating McBoatface. Um, <laughs> so although in this case that name didn't stick, um, <laughs> Some things within projects, your project may well change and it can change, but you need to have quite a good reason for changing that name as well. So I'm going to pass you back over to Mike to go through his experience and some of the conventional routes of funding. Thanks very much, Paul. <coughs> so um, so uh, I'd just like to give my experience of actually applying for some money first, because in order to do a pitch, you need someone to pay your salary. You need you need a way of living, don't you? And you need to know where the money is going to come from. And so, to begin with, I'd just had a bit of time. I'd had the sort of nine months to build up a bit of work beforehand and to have a bit of an idea of what I was going to do and to start making plans to apply for things. And it wasn't an immediate success. So, firstly, I, uh, I, I was planning to do a, a PhD. It was entirely attached onto a clinical trial. The clinical trial was going to be really big. My laboratory work was going to be fantastic that came with it. Huge publications all around. But actually, after lots of planning, that fell through. I think clinical trials could be very difficult to attach things to. And so after a few months of planning that, I had to change my mind. So I then went on and applied to the Wellcome Trust, 
which, uh, as you can see from my summary, I can remember. I can remember doing those all those 80 pages, including trying to do all the finances down to the last pipette tip. And uh, and the, the the letter I got back was was very short. You know, thank you for submitting your research. All looks very good. No, we don't want to fund you. <laughs> But I, I was then very fortunate to then be able to apply to NHS Blood and Transplant, who have actually got, went on to fund me for a clinical research fellowship. And it is really important to have someone that's willing to fund your salary, give you some money to actually do the research. And you have to pay tuition fees as well for the privilege of doing this research, so you have to bear that in mind. I think there are, a few, there are quite a few different routes you can go down. I think these are the ones that most people will have heard of as sort of the top of the list, and these are often very kind of prestigious research council type positions. There's a real quite variety of different things that will be funded by each of these bodies. I'd say the Wellcome Trust is usually funding relatively basic science, but I was interested to hear Jill say that she was funded by the Wellcome Trust uh, in, in a program to bring clinicians into basic science laboratories, so this is not exclusive with the MRC then starting to have things which are still relatively basic science, but perhaps a bit more translational. And then the NIHR, who I do most things with now, being the people to go to if you really want to do more clinical work or funded clinical trials. And you'll see that a few clotting labs in particular managed to get the British Heart Foundation to pay for things. I think the trick there, which I think has been learnt in all the labs that Jill's worked in, is you have to find an angle <laughs> where you can say, my basic science platelet research will benefit lots of people who might have heart attacks in the future. <laughs> That's the key. But there are lots of other routes as well. So uh, the, the blood service do fund, uh, do fund a, f a, a, a few clinical research fellowships. I've got to say, I've found them to be a, a very good employer indeed. And there's a real breadth of different things that can come under that. Uh, there are some local charities, certainly in Oxford, there are a few local ones that will fund things. And I think Paul's going to talk about uh, discussing things with the pharmaceutical industry. Things, having been through all these things, of having to go through all these stages of actually planning and applying, you will find that there are some uh, research fellowships and PhDs out there which are already fully funded. And actually there's one in my research group at the moment. I don't mean to, I say my research group, the research group I work in. <laughs> okay. But, the, but there's, there's one there at the moment which will fully fund someone on a registrar salary for three years and lead to an Oxford PhD. And so these things are out there if you go and have a look um, on the internet or in the BMJ. So thanks, Mike. So um, there are, as Mike said, other routes of funding. And I, during my PhD, was purely funded by uh, the pharmaceutical industry via in investigator-initiated grants. So... In the and I think there's some ma many advantages of this in terms of what it can bring as well. So within my first part of my research, I was funded by, by Octopharma, and one of, my, one of the big advantages of this is being able to be involved in a large clinical study and set up a um, satellite study with, within that, which I'm still working on now, um, five years down the line in terms of getting results of. There's many different schemes that, you, that are now available, and, if, and I've been through various of the websites. If anyone wants to chat to me about the different options in terms of the nuances, um, please find me at some point later on. But I, what I would say is, um, of the, I purely do hemophilia research, so this is just what's going on in, in hemophilia. I'm sure there's other ones in the sort of thrombosis world as well. The t I put them purely alph in an alphabetical order, but the, the Bayer Grant has funded quite a few registrars in the UK to do very good projects. So Jill Pike, um, for her Factor 11 research, it's funded uh, Julie Tar Tarrant from York to go across to Kingston for a few years to work with um, David Lucrap. And Martin Scott's currently working up at the NHD um, on the, a BHAP program as well. And within some of the initi investigator initiator programs, one of um, our PhD students, Sackett Battle, has been working on the UK PK study, which funded me for the end of my research to sort of help develop that study. And there's smaller programs like the Griffles Martin Villar program, which allows you to do a, a year's research project with um, reasonable funding to develop something, which I've taken up in this year. There's lots of different routes, but what I would say is these things come around once a year. If you're thinking about this sort of route of funding, you need to be thinking about early. And then to get, when, from getting these awards, then they may take another almost a year to, for the funding to hit, hit the bank balance. So if you're looking at that route, you really do need to think early and sort of apply for them. And the actual application process, I think from your experience with Welcome, are actually slightly simpler. They're, they're not 80 page um, applications. They usually involve a letter of intent that's maybe a page of, in length. 
and then submitting a full proposal that might be about five, ten pages, in depending on the different stream. And the costing is far less complicated than doing that last pipette tip. So they're good options to look out for. But not everyone's going to want to do an MD or a PhD, and there's many other ways that you can become involved in research or get additional training in hemostasis um, alongside things. So in terms of things that I found, which I'd not actually heard about before, there's, there's various different training fellowships which you can go to different centres around the world. So the ones that advertise, the BSH advertise funding where you can go for a few months to a centre to get experience. The ISTH does as well. And there's also just a joint programme that's been set up between the ISTH and, and EHAR to go to a centre somewhere else in the world. And I think this is a great experience. You get a completely different perspective on how things work in another country and how people practice. One thing I've also been involved in is the Achieve programme, which is um, a funded programme that allows you to spend two weeks in the centre within, within Europe. And the centres that are shown on... Um, on slides, so at the top is Berlin where I spent um, two weeks, in between is in Malmo and at the bottom is in the University Hospital in, in Leiden and there's, it's a great programme which gives a really good um, different perspective and you get to meet lots of different clinicians from over Europe as well while you're involved in that and it really is a good experience and as Mike said there, there are various different clinical research fellow posts which are available so you don't necessarily need to do, if you don't want to do an MD or PhD you could just spend a year doing uh, um, time in a centre getting more experience and there's many of these advertised on NHS jo um, jobs and at the moment in terms of ones just looking on the train there's, there's a very good one that's been advertised at the Royal Free at the moment if someone's interested. So aside from that there's hundreds of meetings. Meetings seem to be like music festivals. Every year there seems <laughs> to be more and more of them appearing and less time to ever go to them. Um, so within in the UK there's BSH and BSHT and there's multiple hemostasis ones that come up um, either annually or biannually. But also there's specific programs that are aimed at us registrars rather than at, at consultants and researchers and there's a number of these which come up through the year. We, a lot of these are funded by the pharmaceutical industry but the, the programs are purely led by the clinicians and they're great chances to get, in, to get a feeling of what's going on and also to network and meet people from other centres. So if, I, I've been to many of these ones so if you, if you are interested just sort of catch me at some point and I can take you through how to get involved in them because they're, they're really good chances to do things. So. I'm just going to pass you back to Mike for the last part. <laughs> okay, so the, the last part is just one other initiative we've got going on with research at the moment in non-malignant hematology. And Hemestar, which is the hematology, uh, sorry, I see the hematology bits disappeared at the top, the Hematology Specialist Trainee Audit and Research Network uh, is a group that I run with Pip Nicholson. I don't know if you want to wave, Pip. There's Pip. <laughs> and this is something sponsored by the NIHR but where we're trying to have a, a registrar in sort of each region of the country who's you know, got some sort of research interest, who's going to help to kind of try and drive forward clinical trials in the area, try and help open uh, clinical trials, try and help recruit patients to those trials. And that's worked very well so far with the trials that we've done. It's also a real opportunity, if we want to do research, to be able to actually gather lots of people together. You know, if you think you're, you could do your local audit or you could actually try and do something with everyone across the country and try and do something really big. And so even if you don't want to do a really big piece of research like a PhD, this is something else that's out there and please do get in touch with Pip or I if you're interested. So just want to summarise this talk um, and say that there really are lots of opportunities out there to do research. I think if you're interested then you do have to spend quite a long time preparing beforehand and I hope the, the two people who put their hands up, I hope that's been the case. Um, I'd say both a PhD and an MD are both really good options and it's really worth considering a wide range of funding resources and trying to speak to as many people as you can. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>